You know, we often try to do things as best we can, as logically as we can, and we try to do things decently and in order uh, when it comes to Sunday mornings. And and uh, I try to give the information that I can to Brother Tommy and the rest of them when I, when I have it. And, and this week was another one of those weeks where Brother Tommy, I stressed him out right to the very last moment. And I didn't, didn't get it out. And Brother Marty tries to ask God to lead and guide and direct him when he gets songs together. And uh, I know it's, it may be foreign to people that don't understand how that all works, but um, a song leader that just gets up and leads songs that are, that are just songs and he just tries to lead them, that, that doesn't have a great impact. But when a man tries to pray about what God wants him to sing... Uh, and wants the choir and, and everybody to sing, then, then that has an impact. And I, Brother Marty got his information out long before I did this week. And uh, I intentionally didn't look at it because I didn't want to know what his songs were until I got my thoughts done. And that didn't happen until late this morning. And then I see that God had our, our hearts united in ways that I didn't understand and didn't know uh, until, until we started singing this morning. I've already made mention that I'm, I'm thankful for our freedom. I'm thankful that we live in a nation where we have freedom. Uh, I'm thankful that we have a declaration of independence that makes us a sovereign nation. Then we have a constitution that guarantees or grants us rights. And there are differences between rights and privileges. And often we get that line confused and we, we, we muddy that up a little bit. And often we think that our privileges are our rights, but... Uh, we have to understand there are certain things that in our Constitution give us rights. Uh, and then after that, the nation and, and our state extend to us privileges. And one of the things that I often found in, in my previous line of work was um, when it came to people having a driver's license, they would often tell me, you, you're infringing on my rights. And what I have to remind them is driving is a privilege. It's not a right guaranteed by our Constitution. And people get that muddied up a little bit. But the fact of the matter is that's a privilege extended to us. But I, I, I'm concerned that our Christian values are under attack. Our freedoms that are, are granted us by our Constitution, and, and I, I don't want to get political again. I, I try, to, try to not be political, and I, I try to remain as neutral as possible. But I do see that Christians are being... being uh, our ability to share what we believe and what we think is being infringed upon. Uh, and I'm starting to, to be a little concerned that, that we live in a world where everybody has a right to speak except for God's people. And I see that starting to take place. And I, I, I want to say this. There is not anybody, and I know that uh, I don't know when it happened. I don't know how it happened. I don't know how it came upon us. Uh, but if we stand upon Christian values and we preach what we believe the Word of God to say, suddenly then everybody can tag that we are uh, hateful and that we are bitter and we're insensitive and that we uh, have phobias against everybody that's different than Christians. And folks, the fact of the matter is nothing could be further from the truth. The Word of God teaches us to love our fellow man, even those that don't believe like we do. We are to love our enemies. We are to extend ourselves to our enemies. We're, to, we're supposed to try to help our enemies and, and feed our enemies even. And, and, and somewhere along the line, we have decided, or the world has decided, that if we stand upon Christian morals and values, that that means that we hate everything else. And I'm going to tell you, I don't believe that's the fact. So what they've decided is they'll start to try to silence God's people in an effort to try to take that out of our society. Well, I'm not going to get quiet and I'm not going to back down and I'm not going to shy away from the fact that I believe the Word of God to be 100% absolutely, completely and totally truth. I don't think our church should back down from that. I don't think we need to worry about what the world says. Our preaching, and I think I touched on that during uh, Memorial Day, our preaching shouldn't worry about fear and favor of men. We just need to be worried about doing what God wants us to do. 
And we need to stand firm upon the word of God. And what our world should be able to see is that we can stand firm upon the values and the teachings of the Bible. And we can love our fellow man, even those that disagree with us, even the, those that don't like us. They can still see that we love them. And I hope we do that. You see, one of the things that I find so important is that we understand freedom and we understand the importance of freedom and our national freedom, how important and precious uh, that is. And we don't have to look very far to see nations that are run by dictators or monarchies or, or whatever the case may be, where they are subjected to the ideals and the opinions and the values of one person uh, or maybe a group of people. And in our nation, we have the freedom to believe and worship and practice and do as we see fit so long as we fit into the values and the laws that our nation has established. Now, I believe a nation has to have laws because otherwise it would just be anarchy and people would run around and do whatever they wanted to. So we have to have some law, we have to have some rule, and we can certainly prove scripturally that the Bible supports government. It's a fact. The governments God has given us, and we have to respect authority. We have to, uh, and Jesus himself even said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, and render unto God what is God's. There is that which is government, there is that which is God, and we have to stand firm upon what we believe uh, the, the Word of God to say. Now, when it comes to our, our national government, I'm all in support of laws that are good and uh, that are right. I am not in favor of laws that contradict the Word of God. Fact. I'm not, I'm not in favor of those things that contradict what the Word of God says. And I'm not going to get all off into that this morning. But I just want to say we need to be reminded that our freedom, uh, as we, we said on Memorial Day, our freedom came at a great cost. Men and women that were willing to go and lay their lives down. Many have. Many have been willing. Many have gone the, uh, into the service and fought and defended our nation. And they were willing to lay their lives down. Thankfully, the overwhelming majority has come home, but we know that in the, the course of our nation's history, many have given their lives and their blood has been poured, uh, poured out so that we might have the freedoms that our flag represents. The flag is a flag, but what it represents is so much more. I'm thankful for that. But I want us to think about something that is more important. And, and, and my thought this morning would be free indeed. It's a simple thought, uh, and sometimes we lose sight of that. And, and if you've got your Bible, I want to start in the 8th chapter of the book of John. Free indeed. And that's, uh, we just sang a song, and that's why I was so thankful for uh, God leading Brother Marty. God hopefully uh, will lead me throughout this, and it will have the effect that it's supposed to have, and, and we'll be able to leave here saying it's been good to be in the Lord's house. But I want us to consider, church, what it means to be free indeed. You see, we, uh, we get saved by the grace of God, and then it seems like uh, we're on fire for a short period, and it seems like life is new, the world is new, everything is bright and beautiful, and, and things are going our way, and it seems like nothing can hold us back. When we initially get saved, everything is so new. This, this new creature, this new life that we have, this uh, newness that we experience, and how that everything is bright and beautiful, and we experience real, true freedom spiritually for the first time in our life, and everything is so new and so miraculous and we get so caught up in that and we're excited about it and we'll tell people about it we'll tell people about what God does for us but then it doesn't seem like it takes very long for the world to start to cloud our vision again it doesn't take very long for the world to start to beat up on us and, and they'll try to take away our, the world will try to remove our influence. Satan is a real, very real, very uh, uh, powerful adversary that you and I fight against on a daily basis. And Satan will try to get us trapped into an, the old way of life that we left behind when we get saved. And we have this newness. Satan wants to rest, uh, restrict us and Satan wants to put blinders on us. And Satan wants us to get back into the old way of life so that we're not living this new life that we tell people about Jesus all the time. 
That's what Satan's desire is. He wants to confuse. He wants to distract. And he wants to blind. And he wants to bind us. And I want you to be reminded, church, this morning, that when Jesus Christ sets us free, uh, we'll see right here in the verse of Scripture, that we are free indeed. Now, that's not a temporary freedom. That's not a, 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 a simple freedom. I want you to understand that is a spiritual freedom. Certainly in this nation, we are blessed to have the freedoms that we have. But folks, I'm here to tell you, we can lose those freedoms. Those freedoms can be taken away. We can come under attack. Another nation may overtake ours and, uh, and make us fall under their rule. And, and you may say, well, that could never happen. Let me tell you, I'm not so sure that it could never happen. But I want to tell you, for right now and for today, I'm thankful that for the freedom that I have been given. And I will live free as long as I have the ability to live free. But this is of man. The freedom that you and I have to come and worship here, our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, those are the devices and the things of man. They can be removed. They can be snuffed out. They can be restricted. They can be changed. And we can find that they can do all kinds of things to make a mess of what we have been given and blessed with. But when we talk about spiritual freedom... I want you to understand that no device of man can remove that. No government can restrict that. Nobody can take that away. And I will stand firm on Baptist doctrine that once you are saved by the grace of God, that is an eternal salvation that nobody can touch or take away. I'm not going to get all off on, on the, uh, the fact of that this morning. We may touch on that if the Lord leads and we have time. But I want us as God's people this morning, as we consider the freedoms that we enjoy nationally, I want us to think most importantly about our spiritual freedom. And we find in John chapter 8, verse 30, it says, And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Jesus is teaching and he's speaking. And if we go back just a little bit, in the 28th verse, he says, When you have lifted up the Son of man, then shall you know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that has sent me, uh, he that has that sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Now, as a Christian, one of the greatest encouragements I could give you is to strive to live a life and do things that would always be pleasing unto the Father. If we want to have the best possible walk we can have, we ought to walk in, in light of what Jesus did and try to do everything. And I know it's not, it's not fleshly and physically possible, but we can work a little harder tomorrow than maybe we did today. To strive to do everything that is pleasing in the sight of our Heavenly Father. Because if we'll do that, then we know that we're walking in His will. And as Jesus spoke these things, many believed on Him. Then in the 31st verse, it says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed. Now there are some clauses in this. I always, I always pay attention to the, the ifs and the buts. I always say that a lot. He said, if ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's seed, and we have never we and we're and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? Now see, people think about things all the time in a fleshly way of thinking. We think about national freedom. Uh, they were talking about their lineage. They were talking about not having been uh, necessarily in bondage. They said, we've been always been free. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily I, verily I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. I want you to think on these things. You and I as Christians, you and I as saved individuals, as the children of God, I want us to consider who and what we serve in our life. It's going to be a, 
And one of those where we have to think a little bit and take away from it. And I want us to leave here rejoicing in the fact that when we are made free, we're free indeed. He said, if we live and we commit in sin, we are servants to sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Church, I want us to be reminded this morning that when we are saved by the grace of God, we are made free and we are free from the bondage of sin that restricts the rest of the world. We have spiritual liberty. We have spiritual freedom. We are no longer bound to the sin of life. We are no longer bound to those chains that restrict us being able to live our fullest, best life because we have been made free. The blood of Christ has been imputed into our lives and our hearts and by that we have freedom from sin. One of the things that I see happening in our world today is that people get saved and then before long we find that they start walking in the ways of sin again. They get caught up in the things that they used to do, the things that they used to be. And folks, I can tell you as I have, uh, I have struggled with, uh, with weight my whole life, I was, uh, I was the kid that wore husky pants. In elementary school, I, I fought it my whole life. I've struggled with it. At one point, I was I was uh, quite a bit heavier than I am now, and I got serious about it. I, I buckled down and I said, "I'm going to lose this weight." And I worked at it. I ate right. I exercised. I did all those things, and I found that I found some liberties in those things. It was freeing to be able to have uh, 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 to have shed that addiction and gotten away from my eating habits and those things. And I say these things because they're very serious. And then somewhere over the course of uh, when I graduated the police academy, I started getting lax again. I was like, you know what? I can just live a little bit again. And then I found that I started right back in my old habits. I started eating the things that I shouldn't be eating. And look at me now. I was, I was 195 a few couple of years ago, and now I'm 230. Y'all may say, preacher, y'all not tell how much you weigh. I don't care. Y'all can see it. It's not like I can hide it from you. But I know sin is the same way and, and we find that, that we get freedom, we get saved and we have this liberty and we have this excitement and we have this newness of life and then before long, you know what, we'll try just a little bit of something here. Maybe this wasn't so bad. Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can just dabble a little bit in this and then we find that we're going to dabble a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. God's still right here and we find that we're getting a little bit more over here. You see, that's the way sin works in our life. And that's exactly what Satan wants us to get into. That's exactly the way that Satan wants us to live. He wants us to be enticed just a little bit over here. And we find that this may feel good for a season. But the problem with that is that season is short. And that season runs out, so we, we have to step a little bit more to get another season and to get a little bit more. But what we find is that in Christ, that newness, that freedom, that spiritual liberty that we have, that is totally and completely fulfilling. When we get saved and we have that new joy in our life, think about how good it was the day or the night when God saved your soul. How new you felt and how miraculous it was and how enjoyable it was just to sit and bask in the presence of Almighty God. Think about how good you felt on that. And then we find that Satan will entice us with just a little bit of sin. And we start down that course again. You see, I want you to understand that we are free indeed. And when we experience that freedom, that means that we flee from the very appearance of Satan. We flee from the appearance of sin because we know deep down that it's not good for us. The donuts. Power rings, we called them at the police department. Donuts. Absolutely love donuts. I didn't know it till uh, last year. Brother, Brother Marty is a terrible influence. He introduced me to blueberries, the cereal. I could kill a box of blueberries in an evening. Love them. They don't come out, but once a year, frankenberries and blueberries, a weakness. It's like my kryptonite, and I'm telling you, 
Uh, it's like October. It's just around the corner. I know what's coming. I know it's there. And I can't wait. But you know what? I've got to get back on track. I've got to get myself back where I need to be because I enjoy having that freedom and that ability and feeling better. And I enjoy life more when I'm not refined and I'm not rather not confined to my addiction to the things that I used to eat. And it's no different in our spiritual walk. Addiction is the same, and we find that there are a lot of different addictions. There are a lot of different problems, and we can find, folks, that we can become addicted to sin. We can become addicted to those things that please the flesh, but they don't please the Father. They don't please God. And I want us to remember that when we are made new and we are made free, that that supersedes and is far better than anything the world has to offer us. The gifts of God, the goodness of God, the fruits of the Spirit are better and they're beneficial. And what we find is that when I was eating right and exercising more, uh, I didn't have to worry about my blood work. I didn't have to dread going to get my blood drawn. I didn't have to worry about all those things that I constantly worry about when I'm not doing like I should. I found that I can eat right. I can go and I can get my blood drawn. And the doctor says everything looks good. And they don't have to give me that phone call and say, all right, we need to talk about this, and we need to talk about this, and we need to talk about this. We need to get this in check, and we need to get this in order. When I'm doing things right, I don't have to worry about that phone call. And it's the same way in our spiritual walk. When we're doing things right, we don't have to worry about coming to church and hearing a sermon. We don't have to worry about what the preacher's going to say. We don't have to worry about God convicting us of our sin constantly because we're doing things that we ought not be doing. We can live a life that is free from sin, and we can live a life that is free in the Spirit, and we can have a better walk of life. Romans chapter 6, we find some uh, very simple verses of Scripture. And I was going to start in the 14th verse, but I want to go back to the 12th verse, Romans 6 and 12. We find that uh, today we're no different than the children of God have ever been. Our desires are the same. Our lusts are the same. The appearance of sin is the same. Now, I think one of the things that's changed in our society is the way that our society embraces sin is different than it used to be. It used to be, even in the community I grew up in, I may have told you this before, where I grew up, if you didn't go to church on Sunday, folks would look at you different. Folks would say, you know what, you're supposed to be in church and you didn't go to church this morning. We noticed you didn't go to church this morning. And I had a great aunt that lived on the other side of the, she lived uh, on the other side of the, the hill behind us. Uh, you walk up the top of the ridge and go down on the back side of the ridge there and that's where my great aunt lived. And if Bonnie knew you wasn't in church, she was calling wanting to know why you wasn't in church. Why did you go to church? It didn't matter. She didn't care if it upset you. She didn't care if you liked it. She didn't care uh, anything about it. She wanted to know, and she wouldn't settle with, I didn't feel like going. She wanted specifics. Why wasn't you in church? Because to her, there was no good excuse for God's people to not be assembling themselves in the house of God. That's just the way she lived her life, and she knew what was right and what was beneficial as much as it might have irritated us, and we might not have enjoyed it, and we might not like to hear it, and it wasn't just her, there were others, but there were certain people that if you wasn't in church, they wanted to know why, and they didn't just settle with, I didn't feel like going. That didn't work. Well, why didn't you feel like going? Do you not know how good God is? Do you not understand what God's done in your life? Do you not understand how God's blessings have been in your life? Do you not understand that God saved your soul? I mean, she didn't mind to tell you just exactly what she believed and what she felt. And in the end, when you hung up the phone, you felt guilty. Why? Because she was absolutely right. She was absolutely right. The simpler solution is to get yourself out of bed, get up and get your clothes on and go to the house of God and let God bless you and pour His anointing spirit out upon you that you might be able to have an enjoyable, blessed, fulfilled life. That's what God wants. He wants His children to have a good, fulfilled life. Back in the 12th verse, it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as the instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. Think about that. As those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of, of righteousness unto God. 
For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, one of the problems with that is, is that we find just like our national liberties, uh, we find that we may try to trample upon those things occasionally. And what we find is that God's people will often trample upon the grace that sets us free and gives us spiritual liberties. We'll trample on those things from time to time because we'll dabble in sin and we'll dabble a little bit more and we'll try this and we'll try that. And we just say, well, it's just a little bit. It's not going to hurt anything, but I'm telling you, I believe that God is burdened when his people don't follow his will. I think it hurts God. I think it it disturbs him. And I don't think he likes it. So it says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Now what does that mean, dominion? That means rule. That means control. Sin should not control God's people. Now think about that. I just got back from being on a boat Where it was, we could eat 24 hours a day for those 10 days that we were stuck prisoner on that boat. We were able to eat and eat and eat. They had ice cream all the time. I destroyed the ice cream. I mean, I was, it didn't matter. Breakfast, I thought I'd have some ice cream. Lunch, I'd have ice cream. Supper, I'd have ice cream. I just, I killed it every day. I just enjoyed it. And I was like, well, I can fix that when I get back. I can take care of it later down the road. That's the way sin is in our lives. We think, well, I can try it just a little bit here, but I'll correct that tomorrow. I can ask God tomorrow to forgive me for what I've done today. You know what? God would rather us say, I'm going to flee from the appearance of sin today and not embrace it. And that way I don't even have to ask forgiveness for tomorrow. I can just stay right where I need to be. I can stay in my course. You see, sin shouldn't divide or shouldn't have dominion over us. Sin shouldn't control us. Sin shouldn't say, well, I've got you right where I want you, and I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to keep you right here. That's exactly what Satan wants in our lives. God's people, he wants us to be so sidetracked that he controls our thoughts, our ideals, our opinions, and our actions. When in fact, God wants us to live in his liberty and live in his grace. He says, why then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Don't trample upon the graces of God. He says right here, God forbid. That means God does not want that. God does not desire that. God does not want us to live in a life of sin. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And this is where I I don't want to get on your toes so much, church, but I want to ask you, what do our friends, neighbors, relatives, uh, co-workers, and I'm as guilty, I stand before you guilty today. What do my friends, relatives, co-workers, all those around me, what do they see in my life? Do they see a man that's committed to the Word of God? Do they see a man that is absolutely going to live the life that I should? Do they see a man that is enjoying the fruits of the Spirit, that is living in the laws of grace and the liberty thereof? Or do they see a man that will dabble in sin from time to time and dabble a little bit more and then dabble a little bit more? I'm going, to let, I'm going to let those people make those assessments, and I don't want to tell you what I think they see, but I'll tell you, I stand guilty. Because too often I've allowed myself to obey and become a servant of sin rather than a servant of God. And I ask God forgiveness for those things. You see, He wants us to be of obedience to righteousness. He goes on and says in verse 17, But thanks be, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And I want you to think about that. Now there's a, there's a whole lot in that. If we try to chew on that and dissect it this morning, I want you to understand that he says that we used to be servants of sin, but now we are servants of God from that doctrine that we believe, not with our mind. And this is an important part of this. In my opinion, a very important part of this verse is that we grasp the fact that our hearts believed unto righteousness. Not with our mind. And what we find today is, and one of the things that I, will, I see constantly in uh, churches and of, of religions of the world today is that they will tell you that you can make a conscious, a conscious decision to be a child of God. 
They'll tell you, don't you today want to decide to be a Christian? Well, let me tell you, I believe it's a much uh, more significant event in the life of an individual. I think that God convicts us of sin. I think that God lets us know that we are lost and separated from Him. And then I think that God draws us unto Him and we find a place of repentance and we put our trust and our faith in our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. And I believe with the very end inward parts of man with the heart of man he believes unto righteousness it's not a mental decision but it is with the heart that we find that we become uh, the servants of obedience it's that doctrine that with the heart we believe that man is truly saved and that form of doctrine is that which delivers us it's not through a mental decision. And that's what I see so often in our world today. People say, well, don't you want to be a Christian? Well, I, I think logically, if we ask that question, most people would say, yes, I'd like to be a Christian. And then they'll offer them some method, whether it be prayer repeating or whether it be baptism or whether it be uh, uh, let me pray with you or won't you just pray uh, this sinner's prayer or whatever the case may be. There are all these ideals of man that people have tried I myself have tried repeatedly, time after time after time, only finding myself wanting. I tried repeating prayers. I tried accepting Christ. I tried baptism. I tried to go all the ways that men told me, only to find that every single time I was still lost and separated from God. It was not until God shook me right to the very foundations of who I was, right to the very heart of me as an individual that I knew that I was lost. I knew I was bound for hell and people don't want to hear that anymore. Hell is real, folks. Our kids need to know that hell is real. We need to preach that hell is real. We need to preach that hell is hot. We need to preach that hell is a place of eternal separation from God. Our kids, our relatives, our co-workers, our friends and our acquaintances need to know that hell is real. We don't need to shy away from that idea or that doctrine. But it wasn't until that night when I found myself lost and separated from God, I knew that I was going to hell. I knew I didn't have a hope. I knew baptism didn't save me. I knew repeating a prayer didn't save me. I knew accepting Christ didn't save me. I knew that all the things that I tried and said and done that men had told me to do didn't work because what we find is the plan of salvation that God gives us is sufficient. Repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. The world doesn't like to embrace that. The world doesn't like the repentance part especially. They just want to be able to say, well, I want to say I'm a child of God. Let me tell you, I believe the Apostle Paul in Acts 20 and 20 says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we got to stand firm upon the foundation of repentance and faith. Don't let the world take that away from us. Don't let the world try to work us into an easy believing way. Don't let the world try to tell us, well, you make salvation too hard. Let me tell you, I believe God made salvation simple. I don't think salvation is hard. I think getting man's self out of the way is hard. I think when God speaks peace, and we've seen some of our young folks here that have searched after the Lord time after time after time only to come up at the end wanting. And then when they get saved, they say it was so simple. It was so simple. If I'd have just let everything go way back then, I could have gotten saved. And we hear that time after time after time. God's plan of salvation is simple. Men make it hard. But he goes on and says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. When we get saved, we are at that point no longer bound and under the dominion of Satan and sin. We become servants to Almighty God and the righteousness of that He has available for our lost and dying world. 
We become servants to try to teach people about Jesus Christ. We become the mouthpiece for the world that we might show them a good and a better way than what Satan is trying to offer them. We become those that are able to stand up and say, I got saved. I truly got saved. I felt peace beyond anything this world has ever tried to offer. And it wasn't because of anything that I had done, but it was absolutely entirely because of what Christ has done. He goes on and says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' service to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' service to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were, and the were is very important, for when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. You see, when we are servants to sin and we're following after the things of Satan, we don't have to worry about righteousness. Why? Because we are walking in a pathway of sin that leads to destruction. That's what our world needs to understand today. They are walking in a pathway that leads to destruction. We know the scripture teaches us that there are ways that seem right unto men and the ends thereof are death. Our world is struggling. Our world is walking. Our world is traveling in a way of sin. It says when we were servants of sin, we were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things wherever you are now ashamed? Sin, I want you to embrace this church. Sin should make us ashamed. Sin should make us ashamed. How often do we see God's people just walking and doing everything under the sun and it seems like they're not even ashamed of it anymore? Well, let me tell you, that's because we become so immune to the reality of what's going on in our lives that we don't even recognize God trying to get our attention and pull us back in the path that we need to be. So we see that we were servants, but we're no longer servants of sin. We should be the servants of righteousness. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have the fruit unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. Let me tell you, I truly believe that being a child of God and experiencing the grace of God and being saved by God's grace is the greatest experience that anybody's ever going to have in this world. I don't know how many times I watch people, and Shannon probably gets tired of me saying it, I see somebody on TV and they'll say something like, I got this award and that was the greatest day of my life. And I always think how tragic that that's the greatest day of your life. Let me tell you, I, I, I married the girl of my dreams. I absolutely married the girl that I was pursuing for years. Great day in my life. We had a... a, 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 a uh, I always get in trouble. <laughs> Every parent's supposed to think their baby is beautiful. Let me tell you, mine was hairy and purple and not all that beautiful. He was, he was a big purple hairy thing that came out. And I was like, I don't know what to think. <laughs> he had all of his toes. I'm excited about that. But he wasn't the most beautiful little thing. You, you always envision all oh, this beautiful little child's going to come out. They're not all that pretty when, they, when they're born. But I was given this precious, wonderful son that has blessed my life so richly. Great day of my life. I was able to preach in a revival at Lions Missionary Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. The night Levi bowed on a little bench back there and he got saved by the grace of God. Great day of my life. But the greatest moment of my life was when God spoke peace to my soul. Because that will carry me home eternally. And all these other things are great and wonderful. My wife saved. My son saved. Uh, we, we've been blessed with, with churches through the years. And we've been blessed with all these wonderful things. I'm thankful for them. But those things won't carry me home. My soul salvation, the moment God spoke peace to me on that old leather bench, uh, that is the greatest moment of my life. Even after all the accolades and accomplishments I've had, none of them compare to the moment when God removed the burden 
of sin and gave me peace, liberty, true spiritual liberty. And I will never, ever, ever lose what God's done in here. The world can't take it away. They can take away my, my, my national liberties. They can't touch my soul. Now being made free from sin and become service to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness in the end of everlasting and, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're lost and separated from God, I want you to know if you continue in that path and you die, the wages of sin is death. And that is what you will eternally experience. Eternal separation from God, never being saved, and you'll never be in the presence of the one who laid his life down and gave his life for you. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the one that loved all of mankind enough. And those people that say, I I hate them because I'm a Christian. Let me tell you, they don't understand what, it's, what it is to be a Christian. They don't understand the love that we have in our heart and the reason we stand against things in our world, the reason we stand up and say this is wrong or this is wrong is because we love them. It's not because we hate them. It's because we love them. The same way I'd tell Levi when he was growing up, if he did something wrong, I'd correct him. And I, I, I was one of those parents that believed in spanking. I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not ashamed of it. I did, probably didn't do enough of it. But the fact of the matter is, he would, uh, I'd whoop him and he didn't like it. And he'd ask me why I did it. And I would explain to him it was correction. I would explain to him that it brought home the fact. And I could tell him, he's one of those kids, you could tell him a hundred times, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Well, let me tell you, all that was doing was encouraging him to do this. He was in the kitchen one day jumping and, and uh, he had a pool noodle and he was jumping across his pool noodle in the kitchen. I said, don't do that. You're going to get hurt. Don't do that. You're going to get hurt. Don't do that. You're going to get hurt. A few minutes later, I heard wham. And then I heard him crying. I look over and there's blood everywhere. I'm like, well, I told you. We had to take and get him all glued up. I had to get his head glued shut. But I told him, I said, and, and my, the first thing out of my mouth, I think, was, I told you that was going to happen. It wasn't the daddy that loved him up and felt bad for him. I was like, I done told you it was going to happen. And I doubt that there are time after time after time that God tells us not to do something, and we'll take that step. Don't do that. It's not good for you. We'll take that step. And then we get hit right smack in the face. And I no doubt God probably says, I told you not to do that. But at the same time, he's got those big old loving open arms, doesn't he? And we'll take that step right back to where we need to be. And his loving, kind, forgiving arms wrap around us and we can feel his spirit and feel his goodness. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Over in the book of Proverbs, 29th chapter of the book of Proverbs, the 25th verse. I got two more verses and I'll close. It says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. You walk in the flesh and you walk in the things of this world, my friend, you're going to find yourself ensnared in sin. If you worry about what men think and you worry about the world and you worry about life and you worry about this and that, I'm telling you, you will be ensnared in sin and you can't experience the fullness of the liberties that God has in store. You can't experience life to its fullest and its best. God wants to give you your best life. But you're going to have to walk in His precepts and His ways and His guidance. Or you'll never experience your best, fullest life. Whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. And then we find in the 124th Psalm in the 7th verse, he says, the psalmist says, Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we our escape. We sang a song just a few moments ago about the chains are gone. I've been made free and God 
has ransomed me. Christ has ransomed us. Let me tell you, absolutely, when we get saved by the grace of God, we're no longer ensnared by sin. Satan wants to keep us there. Satan desires to keep us there. But church, we've got to remember, we're not tied down to that anymore. We don't have to give time to sin. We can live and walk in the newness of life in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. My friends, we serve a holy, righteous, sovereign God that made a perfect plan of salvation available that you and I can be free from sin. Let's walk in that. As we prepare for revival, church, I just want to tell you, get yourself right. Sometimes we need to stop and we need to pray and we need to God to help us get ourselves where we need to be in the spirit of revival so that we as a church can do what God wants us to do so that maybe the lost will see that when God's people say we exalt Him, we praise Him, we love Him, we lift Him up, we sing praises unto Him, they need to see that it's real, that we're not just going through the motions, but that we believe what we say. Because they'll see a difference. If we play church or if we come to church, the world will know the difference. I'm here to tell you, I want us to come and have church. I want us to come and experience God. I want us to come and feel His presence and feel Him moving in our hearts and in our lives. Pray this week. Be prayerful. Ask God what you need to do, fix, work, correct, whatever it may be. Maybe you're just exactly where God needs and wants you to be. Continue in that and pray harder. Pray for Brother James as he comes this way. Pray for the lost to come in and hear the truth of God's Word and be saved. Pray that the church will be revived. We've been blessed with great spirit here this year. I'm so thankful for that, and I want that only to continue and get better. But I want us to follow the Lord. We've got to do that. That's imperative. Without that, we'll have no success. Lost person, if you don't know what it is to be free from sin, if you've never experienced that newness of life, if you've never been set free and you've never been made free, I want you to know you can come up here and seek the Lord for the salvation of your soul in repentance and faith. I can't get you saved. This church can't get you saved. That bench won't get you saved. Jesus' blood applied to your soul will get you saved. You go to Him in repentance and faith, He can meet your need this morning. He can set you free and you can be made free indeed. That's why we have a verse of song. If you need to seek the Lord, won't you do so?